Riverside. <laughs> All right, wasn't sure if I was on there. What a wonderful presence of the Lord that I'm sensing is God is here. God is here. And I just encourage you, especially as we get into the Word of God, to uh, just know He's here. Know that He loves you. Know that He cares about every aspect of your life. And so um, I want us to just pray again. and Just ask God to give us ears to hear, eyes to see what He says in His Word, all right? Let's pray together. Lord, we are so, so, so grateful. You're so good to us. You're so patient with us. You're so loving toward us. You extend such grace and mercy to us. I thank you for everything you're doing here at Riverside Church. Excited to hear about the missions trip, Alpha's coming up, the, the ways we connect with one another, the gatherings. Lord, speak to us now through your word. Your word has a transforming effect on our hearts and our minds and our lives. May somebody hear today and respond in faith who has never responded in faith before, Lord, to say, I repent of my sins. I trust in Christ to save me. And may they walk away glorifying you. May we all walk away glorifying and honoring and praising you. We thank you for your presence here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, after we're born, there's two milestone events in our lives. It's when we begin to talk and when we begin to walk. Everyone here has probably experienced the joy of seeing a baby take her first steps. Might have been your little sister or your little cousin, or maybe it was your child, your little baby boy or girl. And very rarely does a child learn to walk on its own. You may have had the one child who just stood up and began to walk. That might be your testimony. Maybe that was you. Um, but very rarely does a child learn to just walk on their own. So if you're a parent, especially if you're a competitive parent and you want your child to walk before others' childs, other people's children, you will try to help them along, won't you? Somebody say amen. Some of y'all are competitive parents, I know it, right? I have one child that didn't really walk until he was about two years old very content to sit down and watch everybody walk around. Um, but you'll put your hands in the child's hands, you'll take a small step, and that child will Im mimic that step. You take another step, the child mimics that step. You're holding the child up, right? It's not walking on its own strength. You take another step, it mimics that step. And so at first the child might be having some trouble standing on their own two feet without falling over, but you'll do it again and again and again, and eventually as a child grows, she learns to depend on you and trust you to hold her so that she can boldly now follow you as you take a step, and she takes a step, and after, day after day, and one day she's able to get, get up and take several steps, and you make sure you have the camera, you make sure you have the, the video, you have everything going to to watch her take her first steps. So she's learning how to walk. We learn how to walk, and it's modeled after how you walk. Friends, we must learn how to walk. We learn how to walk. And as Christians, we're also learning how to walk with God. Uh, we begin following Jesus when we hear the message of the gospel, and then we respond to the message of the gospel in faith. And as Jesus promised to do, he then sends the Holy Spirit from God the Father to fill us and to help us learn how to walk. So as followers of Jesus, we're learning to walk by the Spirit. We've got to learn to walk. We have to learn to walk by the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit guides us as he corrects us, as he teaches us, as he strengthens us. And walking is a metaphor for living, 
right? How you walk is how you live, and it's important. It's important for us as Christians to first acknowledge that we have to learn how to walk. And this is so that we can continue to develop a dependence on the Holy Spirit of God, not try to live by our own strengths. So as followers of Jesus Christ, God wants us to walk by the Spirit. As a matter of fact, it's, it's our delight to learn how to walk by the Spirit. But what does it mean to walk by the Spirit? And does the Bible give us any instructions on what it means to walk by the Spirit? So we started talking about this last week, and we started by looking at the beginning of Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 16 in particular. Let me just give you a short review of what we talked about there. Three points that helped us to understand Paul's emphasis in this chapter. Those three points were live free, obey the gospel, and love others, right? Live free, obey the gospel, and love others. Verse 1 in chapter 5 said, for freedom Christ has set us free. So live free. For freedom Christ has set us free. On the cross, Jesus took on himself all of our sins so that you would not have to pay for them. So he redeems your life. He literally buys it back in order to set you free. And in this book of Galatians, in this letter to the Galatian church, there were some in the early church who were trying to convince these early believers that they needed to add some things from the law as requirements for their salvation, namely the practice of circumcision. But Paul says to them in this letter, if you do that, you are unnecessarily and harmfully submitting yourself again to bondage like slavery. So he says, don't allow that to happen. He says, live free. Everybody say live free. And then in verse 7, he says, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? As new believers, you were running well. So the Christian life is also likened to a race. They were running well. They were killing it, right? And, and Paul says, don't listen to anyone who's trying to divert you from the truth of the gospel. Don't obey them. Don't believe that you need to add anything from the law to your faith in Jesus in order to save you. Remind yourselves of the gospel. So it was live free and then it was obey the gospel. Everybody say obey the gospel. Obey the gospel. And then finally in verse 13, he said, love others. You were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. So the freedom that God gives you through the power of the gospel that you receive by God's grace through faith is to be used to serve one another in love. Everybody say love others. All right. So now, as we're about to begin looking at this text, chapter 5, verses 16 through 26, a couple points. If you're from, maybe you're here and you were raised in church and you were raised in a church where the rules of walking as a child of God were emphasized. There were certain rules that were emphasized. You need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do the other things in order for God to be pleased with you. It was moralistic or maybe legalistic. So as we're going through this, you might be inclined to hear the instructions that Paul gives as just another set of rules to live by. But that's not what these verses are going to tell us. It's not just another set of rules to live by. And then maybe you're coming from a church background where the freedom in Christ was emphasized, right? All things are allowed. The unconditional love of God was emphasized. And maybe you did not hear as much that a holy life was emphasized. And you might be cautious to hear Paul's instructions here about how to walk by the Spirit. It might... It might sound a bit restrictive and not gracious, but that's also not what these verses are going to tell us. And if you don't have a church background and, and all of this might be new, our desire today is that you would hear the gospel and that you too would soon learn to follow Jesus by walking by the Spirit. Here's what I want you to, to know. The instructions, the things that we're going to receive today are a gift from God. It's an invitation by the only God of the universe 
to, to recognize and rejoice that he is walking with us. Can you imagine that the God of the universe is walking with you? Because you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus. So if this is true, just want you to settle in your mind right now. If the God of the universe has decided to walk with you, don't walk away from him. We're going to walk with him. What better walking partner could you have? And so let's dive into the text. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 26. It starts off by saying, Paul says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Let me just mention that the Spirit is the Holy Spirit. As I just said, you're being invited to walk. You're being invited to live your life with the supernatural Holy Spirit of God walking with you. And then it says, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. The flesh refers to our fallen human nature. It's the core of who we are that's affected by the fall. It's not just our bodies. Our flesh is the center of human pride and self-will. So when the Bible talks about living according to the flesh or walking according to the flesh or living by the flesh, it's referring to trying to live by trusting only in myself and my abilities other than the God of the Bible who made me. Just thinking about children once again, maybe you, when you were a small child, you, your parent tried to help you with something, and you're like, I'll do it, I'll do it, I don't need your help. I don't need your help, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. And as a parent, you're just watching them, they're messing it up completely. But they want to do it by themselves. Now, I'm not saying that your children are just fleshly sinners, but your children are fleshly sinners, and they grow up into adult fleshly sinners. We need the Lord. We don't need to just do it on our own. Verse 17 says, for the desires of the flesh are against the, the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other. Last week we talked about, in chapter 4, Paul describes how there was a son of promise, named Israel, who came from Abraham and Sarah, and then there was a son of, bond, uh, son of promise named Israel, and a son of bondage named Ishmael, who came from an illegitimate relationship, in a sense, with Abraham and Hagar, and they did not get along. So he's showing you allegorically how the law and God's grace don't get along there, how the law and living free by the Spirit and walking with the Spirit don't get along. So the desires of the Spirit for you to walk in freedom in relationship with God are opposed to the desires of the flesh, which is to save ourselves through our own efforts apart from Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. That make sense? So it says they're opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. He means the law doesn't control you or direct you. It's the Holy Spirit that directs you. Verse 19, now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. Those are these moral sins, right? And then verse 20, idolatry, sorcery. These are spiritual sins where we make other things like our God. They're idols. We begin to worship other things other than the Almighty God. We begin to appeal and depend on other things rather than God. He goes on to say enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy. These are relational sins. There are ways that we sin against one another. And then he says drunkenness, orgies, and things like this. In other words, this is not an exhaustive list I could go on for days talking about all the ways that our flesh will sin against God. And he says, I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, this is what the Spirit produces, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh 
with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So just three points from this text that I want to bring to our attention. Number one, recognize the struggle. Number two, abide in Christ. And number three, keep in step with the Spirit. Recognize the struggle. As we learn to walk by the Spirit, we need to know that we have opposition. Paul wants us to know that we have opposition. There is no sugarcoating the fact that we have opposition. Look at the comparisons that Paul gives us. I don't know if you can put that text back on the screen. In verse 16, it says, walk by the Spirit, right? So that you don't do what? Gratify the desires of the flesh. There's opposition there. Verse 17, he says, the desires of the flesh are what? Against the Spirit. And the desires of the Spirit are what? Against the flesh. In verse 18, he says, led by the Spirit. If you're led by the Spirit, you are what? Not under the law. You're not under the law. Verse 19, he says, he talks about the works of the flesh as opposed to the fruit of the Spirit. So, the, so there is opposition there. We need to recognize that struggle. Now, pay attention to this. This letter to the Galatians is being written to Christians, to followers of Jesus Christ. So the works of the flesh list in, in verses 19 through 21 I mean, that sounds like he's talking to some wild people. He's not talking to y'all. He's talking to some wild folks out there. Okay? But he's talking to Christians. And can we be honest? What are Christians but forgiven sinners? It's the secret that we don't often want to talk about, right? Because the same thing that sinners do, we're still capable of doing. We're still capable of jealousy. We're still capable of envy. We're still capable of hatred. We're still capable of sexual immorality. We're still capable of racism. We're still capable of murder. Still capable of robbery. Still capable of pride. But thanks be to God. <laughs> There's a difference in the forgiven sinner who has been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. And if I'm a follower of Jesus, I may be capable of these things, but I'm not controlled by them anymore. I might be capable of these things, but I'm not enslaved to them anymore. I have literally been set free from them. Amen? So as a practice, I need to remind myself that the good news of the gospel says that despite those remaining sins in my life, God the Holy Spirit is walking with me. He's walking with me. So when I place my faith in what Christ has done for me, He died for all of those sins. The Holy Spirit comes to fill me and begins the process of sanctifying me, of making me holy. I begin to walk by the Spirit, not by the flesh. And we're walking by the Spirit. So when we notice the works of our flesh, that's why he says, look, uh, the works of the flesh are evident. So when we notice these things, they're very evident in our lives. When they start to come, the Holy Spirit will convict us of them. That's not to drive you to shame. That's to draw you closer to Him in repentance. That's what the Holy Spirit does. What, what we don't want to do is to get out of step with the Holy Spirit and began to look for a solution outside of our walk with the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? So the Holy Spirit is walking, and you just start to draw back. It's amazing to me how in my life, in the moments I needed God the most, I ran from Him. In the moments when I saw the sin rising up in me, Instead of running to God, I would run away in shame and again have to remind myself of the gospel again that it wasn't anything that I did that merited that relationship in the first place. It was because of God's grace. And so 
as I'm walking with the Holy Spirit, when that sin rises up in me, you know, you can just view the Holy Spirit here walking with you. Just say, hey, here. Here, here you take it. <laughs> here, you, you, you sanctify me. And what that really is is saying, Lord, I, I, I am sorry. Lord, forgive me. Lord, heal me. Lord, take this sin away from me. Lord, uh, here's my pride. Here's my fear. Here's my lust. Here's my anger. Here's my frustration with that person. I, I really, I'm so frustrated with them. I really do want to walk out of step with the Spirit so I can give them the left foot of fellowship that they deserve. Walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh because the desires of the Spirit for your life are opposed to the desires of your flesh which will destroy you. And then in verse 21 when he says, those who do such things will never inherit uh, the kingdom of God. That word do there actually means to practice. Th this, is, this is for those of us who end up having this pattern of behavior without repentance. And can I just say to us today that if we find ourselves in a pattern of unrepentant, sinful behavior, we need to repent and believe the gospel. We need to question at that point in time whether or not we are actually believers in Jesus Christ, following Jesus Christ, and walking in step with the Holy Spirit. It's not a time for despair. It's just a time to repent and believe. So recognize the struggle, number one, and then secondly, abide in Christ. Abide in Christ. In this text, there are several metaphors to answer the same question. How do you live as a follower of Jesus? Verse 16 says, walk by the Spirit. Verse 18 says, be led by the Spirit. Verse 25 says, live by the Spirit. Verse 25 also says, keep in step with the Spirit. They're all metaphors that are describing the same idea of living with the Spirit, walking by the Spirit. So you don't see the word abide in this text, but there's a relationship that I'm, I'm going to show you. The word abide means to remain or, or to dwell, uh, to live. And, and this is the word that Jesus used to describe our relationship with him and what the relationship produces in us. So Jesus is... is is born into a time and a place. It's an agricultural community. They understand trees. They understand sowing and reaping and harvesting. Uh, they're not like some of us who believe that fruits come from the supermarket. They know that fruits come from, come on, y'all, don't, trees, trees. Some of y'all know, some of y'all know. <laughs> and bushes and plants and vines, right? And they're used to reaping and harvesting and everything related to growing crops and living off of them. So in John chapter 15, verses 1 through 5, listen to the words of Jesus to us as believers. I am the true vine, and my Father is a vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Listen to this, abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, I am the vine, you are the branches, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do how many things? If you are walking by the Spirit, you're abiding in Christ. And because you're like a branch abiding in Christ, and Christ is the main trunk or he is the vine, because you're abiding in him, you will produce fruit. So you're not working hard and striving to produce the fruit. The fruit is being produced through you because of your connection to Christ. So in verse 22 of our text, Paul describes for us the fruit that the Spirit of God produces in and through us. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, 
faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So fruit, when it's produced, is seen. You can see it, right? Is it mango season yet? Okay, some of y'all know. And you can tell from the street which one is ripe. And if you're, if you're really saved, you go ask permission before you pick somebody else's fruit, right? Ah, <laughs> uh, just put some conviction on somebody there. So in, in Matthew chapter 7, when Jesus, he's describing prof, false prophets, he says, you'll know them by their fruit. They, can't, they can tell you one thing, but all you have to do is taste and experience the fruit. and You'll know they're not who they say they are. Paul doesn't um, mention the fruit here so that we can, with this legalistic or moralistic mindset, buckle down and, and now say, okay, well, here are the 10 steps to love. Here are the five steps to patience. Here are the, the 12 steps to joy. The nine rules of self-control. He mentions the fruit here because we can notice how... He mentions the fruit because we need to notice how are we in step with the Holy Spirit and how is the Holy Spirit working in our lives? We'll know that by the evidence of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. But again, this is not something you're trying to produce. The fruit of the Spirit is not about production. It's about connection. Paul contrasts the works of the flesh with the fruit of the Spirit. Not, not, it's not the works of the Spirit. Did you notice that? It's the works of the flesh, and it's the fruit of the Spirit. Because if you attempt to create what should be naturally produced, that's called artificial. It's called fake. It's not real. Don't try to create the fruit of the Spirit in you. Because the fruit of the Spirit, again, it's not about production. It's about connection. Stay connected to Christ. Abide in Christ. Abide in Christ. Depend on Christ, and it will supernaturally grow. Stay close to him. Well, how do you do that? Well, um, just a quote by Warren Wears Wearsby. It said, he says this, uh, the contrast between works and fruit is important. A machine in a factory works and turns out a product, but it could never manufacture fruit. Fruit must grow out of the life, and in the case of the believer, it is the life of the spirit. When you think of works, you think of effort, labor, strain, toil. But when you think of fruit, you think of beauty. You think of quietness. You think of the unfolding of life. The, the flesh produces dead works, but the spirit produces living fruit. And this fruit has in it the seed for still more fruit. Love begets more love. Joy helps to produce more joy. Jesus is concerned that we produce fruit, more fruit, much fruit, because this is the way we glorify him. And the old nature cannot produce fruit. Only the new nature can do that. Amen? Amen? So recognize the struggle, abide in Christ, and finally, keep in step with the Spirit. That's from verse 25. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Walking by the Spirit means that we need to walk lockstep with the Holy Spirit as He works in our lives. Walk lockstep with the Holy Spirit as he works in our lives. And, and we may have the tendency to say at that point, oh, I get it, that's where my effort comes in to save me. I have to work to keep up with the Spirit. I got to work to keep up with him. He's holy. He's way ahead of me. I'm barely catching up, but I'm going to work really hard. I'm going to run really hard to, to keep in step with the Spirit. But that's not correct. You see, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Jesus. Same Holy Spirit, sent from God the Father, sent from God the Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And listen to what Jesus also had to say to us. It's another agricultural illustration. In Matthew 8, I'm sorry, Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30, he says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke 
upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So you, you know that that yoke, it's an agricultural illustration because it's a yoke that goes on cows, right? Or beasts of burden. Let's just call it cows. So in this illustration, you're a cow. You comfortable? You good? All right. So in this illustration, you're a cow, and Jesus is a bigger cow. All right? So there's a yoke on you and, and he. You're both plowing the ground, and Jesus says, listen, uh, you're along for the ride. I'm doing all the work. Okay? You're along for the ride. I'm doing all. You get all the benefits from learning about this job, but you're not really putting in any effort to accomplish it. He's with you. He's with you. He's with you. He, he's giving you the power to keep up. He's not leaving you behind. He's helping you to walk in step with him. You just have to come to him. You just have to come to him. Uh, Paul wrote this letter to the Galatians church and to us. He wrote it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit who walks with us is reminding us to keep in step with him. And how do we do that? We believe the gospel. We obey the gospel. We trust him. We believe him. We depend on him and not ourselves. Um, so, as we think about the fruit of the Spirit, you might be a student in here today, right? And you're in school, and I, I, if you're a believer, I want to let you know that you can ask God for the patience to take these tests. You can ask Him for the patience uh, to be obedient to your teachers. You can ask God to, to help produce this fruit in you. The asking is, is dependence, where you're saying, God, I want to stay connected to you. I want to abide in you, and I want to see these things produced in me. And as you are uh, experiencing impatience, or maybe some of these other works of the flesh, God, if you've already placed your faith and trust in Jesus, you're not, you're not connecting again, but you are noticing that you want to walk in step with the Spirit, and you want to abide in Christ. And so at that point, you're just saying, here, God, I, I need you. I need your help. Maybe you are in midlife, right? Middle, middle of your life, and, and, and you're wondering if life has passed you by. Um, you're wondering about some decisions that you've made. Would you now just remind yourself of the gospel? Remind yourself that God is with you. Remind yourself that the Holy Spirit is walking with you. Life has not passed you by. You're a child of God. And even if you have made some decisions, even out of your flesh, he has not left you. He is right there with you. Remind yourself of the gospel. Give it to God Abide in him and allow him to produce the, the fruit of joy in your life. The fruit of patience in your life. What about our married couples? I just want to encourage you that you cannot out of your flesh produce the love that's required to love your spouse as Christ loves the church. It's not really possible. And so you have to abide in Christ. And if you, if you are married, uh, you need every aspect of the fruit of the Spirit. You need love. You need joy. You need patience. You need gentleness. You need goodness. You definitely need faithfulness. And you better have self-control. If you're not married, doesn't matter what it is or where you are in life. If you're a senior and maybe you might be in despair, 
about how you're going to be taken care of, you are in step with the Holy Spirit of God. Bring it to Him. He'll hear you. He'll answer you. He won't leave you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that when we could do nothing of ourselves, dead in trespasses and sins, not only did you forgive give us of our sins, when we came to you in the faith that you gave us to even approach, you saved us by your grace and you called us your children, heirs and joint heirs with Christ. Thank you, Lord. And would you help us today to walk in step with your spirit? Would you help us and would you remind us of the good news of the gospel in the moments when we need it most? So our faith and our trust is always in you and not in ourselves to the glory of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.